I'm very pleased that um, it is not the 18th chapter of John's Gospel that we have to finish off in two weeks. Um, rather, it's the midweek Bible study of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And the reason I say that is that in these final verses of the 18th chapter of John, from verse 28 through to verse 40, there are eight distinct scenes that are set. Uh, and you'll find that in the movement of the passage where Pilate is in, and then he goes out, and then he comes back in, and then he goes back out, and so on, as he tries to work around, to wrestle with this dilemma of what to do with Jesus. And uh, we're going to be working our way through that over the next few weeks as the Lord enables us. Uh, the um, theme that we want to follow today is, a, in a sense, a general theme that will cover all of these verses, and it is simply this, truth on trial. And, and in reality, that's what is developing in this final passage of uh, John chapter 18. But let's take a moment uh, for prayer as we ask God to help us understand his word this morning. Our loving Father, we know that your word has not been given for private interpretation. We dare not try to understand spiritual truths by simply applying the logic of our mind. It is not within us to have a capacity or a capability to fathom the deep things of God. We have already learned that we need ears to hear and eyes to see. These are only given, granted by the grace of God. We confess our need we confess our desire to learn more from your word. And therefore we pray that you will now guide us into truth as the Spirit guides truth into us. And may we, like Mary, sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. This we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Thursday morning of this past week, we were in the car and listening to the news. And as I, I mentioned to the folks who gathered for the table talk uh, mid-morning, my ears pricked up when I heard that we now have a new word that has been included for the first time in the Oxford Dictionary. It is the new word, not only of this year, but also of this century, so far. And it is the word, it's a hyphened word, and it's the word post-truth. Now, the reason why this word post-truth has been included for the first time in the Oxford Dictionary is that we are now living in a post-modern world, a world that is filled with uncertainty. There are no constants anymore. No, nothing is written in concrete, as it were. And when it comes to truth, there is now no such thing as truth in the way that we understood it to be. John Wesley once said, that which is true is not new. That which is new is not true. Truth has always been truth, but not anymore. Truth is what we think it ought to be. It's how we perceive it. It's what we feel about it. It is centered on us, not on the reality of a fixed notion. 
And so a postmodern generation apply post-truth realities. It's a little bit like going back into the early Old Testament where we read in the times of the kings when the people of Israel struggled against what they saw to be a, a, a non-necessary discipline in their lives. And it, it came almost right down from the top where everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. They perceived truth to be what they wanted it to be, and they followed it. That's the kind of generation we're in. But truth will always be truth. Thy word is truth. It doesn't matter if we go to a Bible college or a theological seminary and the lecturers there tell us that the Bible doesn't really mean what we think it means. It doesn't really mean what we've understood it to mean over the years. Let me give you a modern context, a modern rendition of what this really means in the culture of our times. And so the Word of God has been twisted. Truth will always remain truth, even if our minds cannot comprehend it, even if our hearts will not be controlled by it. Truth will always remain truth. Jesus prayed in John 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It will not change. Here in this uh, passage, Jesus has been presented before Annas, the God-appointed priest. In verse 26 of chapter 18 of John's Gospel, you will see that Annas, now having looked into and questioned and tried to assess what is happening in the ministry of Jesus and his doctrine and with his band of followers, now sends him off to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who has been appointed by the Romans, and he is now the political high priest, not the God-appointed high priest, but the Roman government-appointed high priest. And um, having been before Caiaphas, he now was sent to the highest court, the high court in the land, which is, of course, the court of the Romans, and Pilate is the governor, and it's before him Jesus must now stand. But you find that in this 18th chapter of uh, John's Gospel, John does something again that is unique, in that he, he doesn't follow the party line. He doesn't go along with the synoptic Gospels. He doesn't record events as do Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John will always be that little bit unique, that little bit different. And so what does John do? He simply states that Jesus was brought before Caiaphas, and then he hastens on to tell us that Jesus then was sent to Pilate. He makes no mention of the trial before Caiaphas. If we want to understand something of the background to that particular trial, we must go into the other Gospels. For example, in Matthew 26 and in verses 57 to 68, you'll have an outline of the trial before Caiaphas. In Mark 14, uh, verses 53 into the first verse of uh, Chapter 15, you'll see the trial before Caiaphas. And again, Luke brings it up in chapter 22, verse 54, into the first verse of chapter 23. There is one thought that comes out in each of those illustrations omitted by John, and that is the emphasis on Jesus 
been struck with a blow on the face. Now, we noted last week that the translation with the palm of their hand it does not comply with the, the, the Scripture. The word there in the original also can refer to being struck with a rod or a stick. And in the book of the prophet Micah, we noted that the prophecy is there, that they would strike him with a rod. And in the uh, standing before his accusers, this is the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. Now, the blows that rained upon Jesus, and we're going to be looking at this in more detail when we come to the actual uh, pre-crucifixion moments when he has been sentenced to death and he has now been treated as a malefactor. We look at this in more detail. But one thing to note is that when the prophet Isaiah is foretelling the death of Christ, he tells us there that his visage, his face, was more marred than that of any man. That was the result of the beating on the face with the rod or with the reed. More of that when we come to the crucifixion of Christ. But there is one brief comment that we need to make on this mock trial of Jesus before we move on in, into uh, the, the teaching of our text. Caiaphas, you will note in reading through the Gospels, sat in judgment of Jesus. Jesus stood accused before Caiaphas. So picture in your mind the scene. The high priest appointed by the Romans, he is a political puppet. He sits on the judgment seat and Jesus the condemned stands before him. Questions are asked. Jesus doesn't give direct answers, but one thing he does say to Caiaphas. Come with me to John chapter 26. Sorry, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And let's look at verse 64. Look at verse 63. Jesus kept silent. And the high priest, that is Caiaphas, answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And what does Jesus say to Caiaphas? Look at verse 64. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, this is his answer. Note, the question is, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Here is the answer of Jesus. I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What will be the ultimate proof, the absolute proof that Jesus is who he said he was? Remember Caiaphas is sitting in judgment. Jesus stands condemned before him. Jesus now said, here is the proof. There's coming a day when I will be sitting as the judge. And you will be standing before me. If you go through into Mark chapter 14 verse 62 and Luke 22 verse 69, you'll find that they all record this same key thought 
this word expressed by Jesus to Caiaphas. Now come with me over to Romans chapter 2 and in verse 16. Romans chapter 2 verse 16. What does the apostle tell us about Jesus? In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. There's coming a day. We may judge him all that we want. We may ridicule him. We may deny him. We may condemn him. We may put him to death. But one thing is sure. One day he will be our judge. Come over to Second Timothy chapter 4. Here the apostle is uh, encouraging this young man in the work of the gospel. He is setting him up to be a teacher of righteousness, to be one who will be faithful in the word. And with what words ringing in his ears is he commissioned to go out and preach the gospel? Look at verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. That's the commission. That's the call. That's the challenge. When you preach the word, preach it faithfully. How? Look at verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's why we must preach the word, because one day we will stand before the judge. The secret thoughts and the public words are all as an open book before him. And on that day the books will be opened. First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 5. How do we feel when those of our work colleagues or those of our neighbors or friends or even family suggest that uh, we ought to slow down a little in our zeal for religion? When they suggest that we need to get a life and enjoy ourselves a little more and not be so caught up with these religious things, what do we say to them? We'll look at verse 4 of First Peter 4 in regard to these. They think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. You know, talking behind your back. You're the odd one out in the family or, or, in, or in the fellowship or, or, or in the communion of your workplace. But here's the reality. They will give account to him who was ready to judge the living and the dead. Christ is the judge. You may well be asking today, what will I do with Jesus but one day you will be asking, what will he do with me? That's the reality. We cannot live our lives as though we are totally independent of God. We cannot justify taking upon ourselves the reins with which we guide the direction of our days and our future. We need to be aware of this reality that one day we will give account of our lives before God. He is the judge. Come with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Verses 9 and 10. Daniel 
Notice the penetration of the heart of Daniel as he receives this glorious vision. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Revelation chapter 20. Begin to open up that scene in verses 11 through to 15. I saw a great white throne, and he who sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and the books were opened. There are four books, and you'll find them all listed in the Gospels and in Paul's letter to the Romans. Four books that are being kept as record of your life and mine and one day when we stand before him the books will be opened those things you have plotted in your mind and agitated in your heart those things that you have thought about which are not worthy of God not worthy of his word those acts that have been superficial, hypocritical, and not fully intended for the good of others, one day the books will be opened. And how will we be judged? Will it be by the accusation of another? Will it be because someone comes and says, I never liked him on earth because he did this, that, or the other? No, it will not be by the word of another. It will be by the books, every word, every action written there, and we will become our own accusers. Now note the setting here in the 18th chapter of John's Gospel, and in verse 28, I want to simply today lead you very briefly into what is a, an introduction to the eight stages or scenes that are set in the final verses of the chapter. Verse 28 of John chapter 18. Jesus has been there before Caiaphas. He has reminded them that one day he will sit in judgment. They will be answerable. They will be accountable to him. And now in verse 28 of John 18, they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. In the early verses of the, this final phase, we have a compromising condition. And I want to just simply outline that briefly. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. Just come back over into Matthew 27 for a moment and read with me verses 1 and 2. Matthew, Matthew 27 verses 1 and 2. Matthew 
tells us here, when morning came, all, note the word all, the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So now in John 18, verse 28, they led Jesus from Caiaphas, the there being all the chief priests and the elders. I had uh, the secretary of a committee that I, uh, I'm, I'm chairman of who uh, was on the phone the other day and he was telling me he was just doing out the annual report and he read out to me the name of all the committee members and the number of meetings that uh, we had through the year and how many meetings each of the committee members had attended. There were two of us that were there at every meeting. That's the secretary and myself. But the others missed a few here or there. Now this is the full Sanhedrin. This is the council of the Jewish church. They are responsible for every synagogue where the Jews meet for worship. They govern the doctrine, the theology, the practice, the custom, the culture. All of these things have to be approved by and commissioned by the Sanhedrin. But not every Sanhedrin member attended every meeting. But here, they are all present. Do you get the impression of the movement of what is now taking place? Already it has been determined that Jesus must die. There's only one final thing to take place, and that is it has to be approved by the Romans. Had it been up to them, it would have been done and dusted. It would all have been over. But there's one final hurdle. They must get it past Pilate. So what must they do? Well, the word is out. We want every member of the Sanhedrin to be present to enforce our desire so that Jesus will be put to death. That's the intensity. That is the need that they see to be their greatest at this particular moment. And so they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So into the governor's house, which also served as the military headquarters, hence the name Praetorium. It housed the military uh, base for uh, the Roman soldiers, and it happened to have a wing that was reserved for the governor uh, at that time, and it was Pilate. So into this Jesus came. And look at verse 28 of John 18 again. We read there that it was early morning. So in Matthew 27, verse 1 and 2, we read, It was morning. It was the morning following the night before. What happened the night before? Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So from the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is marched first to be tried before Annas, then from Annas to Caiaphas, then from Caiaphas to Pilate. And at this stage, the morning now 
is about to break on a new day. The early morning translates with the original word to mean somewhere in the fourth watch between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. So the arrest of Jesus began late in the evening, and they take him through the whole process, and now at around 6 a.m. in the morning, they're about to open up the doors into Pilate's judgment hall. But let me pause for a moment. What does this tell us? They have been pursuing their attack on Jesus all through the night. You see, sinners will pursue sin with a passion. You don't have to encourage them. You don't have to drive them into it. They will follow sin with a passion. So, from the night before to about six o'clock in the morning, they are pursuing the death of Jesus. Now, let me take you back for a moment into the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember Jesus and his disciples. He had called out Peter, James, and John and asked them to pray with him. He had gone a little deeper into the garden. When he came back to see how they were doing, he found them fast asleep. And what did Jesus say? What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Sinners pursued him right through until the morning. Nothing else mattered. And for one hour, the disciples couldn't keep their eyes open. Does that suggest anything about the state of the Christian church today? While the world is driven in the pursuit of evil and of sin, the church sleeps on. What? Could you not watch with me one hour? But then as we go through this, I want to just finish off with this uh, little thought. Verse 28 again. Notice how hypocritical this whole procedure was. They led Jesus to the praetorium. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled or barred from the Passover. They did not recognize that you cannot have a Passover without a Passover lamb. Oh yes, they would go back off quite happily, gaily on their way through the streets of Jerusalem to arrive at the temple and they would go in and they would celebrate the Passover little knowing that the Passover lamb was on trial and soon would be upon the altar and would give his life and die upon the cross. You cannot have a Passover without the Passover lamb. And if you're trusting in your church to save you, if you're trusting in religion to get you over the line, if you're trusting in your good deeds or or efforts to get you into heaven, then let me remind you this morning, you will not be in heaven without the blood of the Passover lamb. Many still trust in type and symbol and deny the reality of faith and fellowship in Jesus. These Jewish leaders were prepared to sacrifice Jesus, but they were not prepared to sacrifice their ritual. You cannot substitute ceremonies for Christ. Now notice what Jesus said about these Pharisees. Come back with me to 
Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Verse 13. Listen carefully. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. What an awful, awful judgment. Scribes and Pharisees, the elite of the elite in the religious festivals, festivities and festivals of, of Israel. And yet, their very purpose, it would appear, is to keep men and women out of the kingdom. Let's keep them occupied with ritual and type and ceremony. Let's get them doing things and convince them that they must be saved by their works. And all the time they're holding closed the door of salvation. Churches condemning sinners to hell by not preaching the gospel of the death of Christ. Let's read a little more. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And read all the way down through to verse 33. And see how Jesus concludes this attack upon the false hypocrisy of the Pharisees. We come down into verse 31. You are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape? the condemnation of hell. Deeply religious, but no knowledge of grace or of Christ. Hypocrites sadly fill our pews and our pulpits, but we cannot replace reality with ritual. We cannot replace the cross with the crucifix. These fanatical, deeply religious Pharisees and church leaders were no closer to hell and destruction than when they were preparing to celebrate the Passover. God's judgment will not pass over us if the blood of Jesus, God's Lamb, has not been applied to our heart foretold, foreshadowed, fulfilled when Christ died upon the cross. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled. Little did they know that the defilement is not of the hands, but of the heart but that they might eat the Passover. And they would eat the Passover without Christ. Let me ask you again this morning, have you yielded your heart to Jesus? 
Are you like these hypocritical Pharisees putting on a pretense, an outward devotion? You're struggling to keep up with all the requirements and rigorous nature of the rituals of your church. You were being told and you are convinced in your mind that you can only be saved, you can only know God through these particular objects and rituals. And yet in your heart there is a, a coldness, a dryness. There's no life, there's no engagement with God. You don't feel his presence unless you're doing these things. You don't know whether he loves you or not. And you have to keep doing these things to try and impress him so that he will love you. You're listening to the word of your minister or priest and you're not prepared to read the scriptures and see what God would say to your heart. And your heart still lies cold and silent. And if Christ were to come at any moment, you're not sure if you would be ready to meet him. Here we have in God's word today the warning. And here we have the invitation. Jesus went all the way to the cross and he died and shed his blood. And now he says to you and to me, come for all things are now ready. You don't have to prepare for the Passover. You don't have to make ready to celebrate the death of Christ. It has all been accomplished for you. You need to trust and obey. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word again this morning, reminding us of these important realities. The Pharisees and members of the Sanhedrin were so against Christ, they pursued his death right through the night. And coming to face the engagements of the final trial, they thought it best to appease their God by preparing for the Passover. So often we turn our back on the reality of a faithful walk with Jesus and we trust in the church to get us over the line. We think that it's by doing, by working, by participating in religious things that we are saved. And yet, your word tells us it's by simple faith. We recognize that we are sinners. There is nothing we could ever do that would purge our heart from sin. It is the blood of Jesus, God's Son, that cleanses. And we have been and we are redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver or gold, but by his precious blood. May your Holy Spirit today teach us that by simply surrendering, by simply confessing our need of Jesus, by repenting of our sins, by accepting the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, you confirm within us that we are yours, and by grace and grace alone we are saved. Be pleased, Lord, to grant us your mercy. In our Saviour's name, amen.